Welcome to the Deco Stop from the Deep Sea Podcast. We've completed our science dive, dropped our ballast, and it's time to ascend to the surface. We spend a lot of time gazing at the abyss, and maybe it's time that the abyss had a little look back at us. These bonus episodes will focus on the more human elements of deep sea science and technology. What career path did people take, and what advice do they have if you want to follow in their footsteps? Tales of adventure, both at sea and in other remote environments and where social and political aspects cross-section deep-sea science. After hearing a few interesting stories over email, uh, we just decided to call up and have a chat with Kat Bolstad. Kat, could you introduce yourself? You've got a really interesting position. Sure. Uh, I'm Kat Bolstad. I lead the AUT Lab for Cephalopod Ecology and Systematics, or ALCES, at Auckland University of Technology in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And my pronouns are she, her. Very good to have you on. You specialize in, in squids and you work a lot with Tapapa and uh, Aniwa over in New Zealand. Yeah, that's right. So our research group focuses on egopsid squids or the deep sea squids, and we look at ecology, biodiversity. And to do that, we have pretty strong connections with some of the research institutes in Aotearoa that are sort of on the front lines collecting stuff. So we work with a couple of museums, Auckland Museum, Te Papa, and with Niwa in Wellington as well. Um, and they sort of know that we're the squid people. And so when they get interesting squids, they let us know. And we get to have a look at those things and uh, see what we can tell about them. And there is an interesting name for the most magical time of year. Can you tell me about Squid Christmas? <laughs> Oh, Squid Christmas is the most magical time of the year. <laughs> so we have students or researchers sometimes get to go out on the ships and participate in these cruises. But when we're not on board, uh, we're lucky enough to be able to put in requests for various things to be kept. And sometimes interesting squids come in that we weren't expecting. And Niwa in particular will save us boxes of frozen cephalopods. And then we just periodically go down and help them clean out the freezers. And we have what we call Squid Christmas, which is where we get to open the mystery squid boxes and find out what wonderful deep sea squid presents they have saved for us. I will say in a couple of weeks, we are going to open up the stomach contents of a giant squid that came in at Squid Christmas last time. So maybe there'll be interesting things to say about that. Is that something you share live or you just sort of report back? Well, we're going to have a slight cast of thousands in the lab sorting, you know, stomach contents on the day and stuff. We're hoping to turn around the results on that pretty quickly. So again, we'll be looking for anything recognizable in there as well as the whatever pieces of tissue we can find. And the, it was a squid that got scooped up in um, a research troll unexpectedly. So ironically, it was a small giant squid that came in in January of this year. So it, so it only weighed 50 kilos. So it fit in a fish bin. And that's the reason that they were willing to save it for us. It didn't take up too much room. They folded it up, you know, nicely like a sleeping cat in a bin. <laughs> this is on our, our Twitter feed as the squid cube and people got quite intrigued and, you know, a few different little news stories got written about it. And so finally, we're going to get the chance to have a look at what was in there after we had plans to do that earlier this year. And they it got lost in transit for a couple days. So like we had everybody lined up who was going to come and help us. And then our giant squid stomach went missing in the mail. So. <laughs> Another thing that most people don't expect, but yeah, no. like losing samples in the mail, like having a completely unique sample. Yeah. And then it gets lost on your flight. Yeah. Pro problems, problems not that many people have. Somebody lost my giant squid stomach today, but it, it appears to at least have remained frozen for the duration of being Good. lost. So the ending of that could have been much worse. And mentioning your, your students, I'm terribly, terribly sorry, but you sometimes recommend this show as, as wider reading. So there will be some listeners surprised to hear you now because you've infiltrated. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, an episode of the Deep Sea Podcast as recommended reading for nearly every week of my Deep Sea Biology course. So thanks for all of the excellent content. I mean, there's there's so much, you know, great stuff that comes out of the show and that ties in with stuff that I'm teaching in particular weeks or, you know, exciting new developments where I can say, well, this is this was the state of knowledge until right now. But, you know, as you discussed in the last episode, people just keep getting more right as they get older, right? <laughs> New information comes to light and we revise our thoughts on things and that's how it goes. Excellent. Oh, I'm really flattered. That That is wonderful. That's, that's lovely to hear. So you got our attention with a few 
interesting stories. And I think I think I'm just going to allow you to to share them. Basically, you have we're pretty sure a record, a very unique record. Do you do you want to share that with us? Because it's brilliant. Yeah, sure. So I I would love to hear from anyone else if there's anyone else in the same boat. But I'm pretty sure I am at least one of the only people on the planet to have expressed milk in a deep sea research submersible. <laughs> and yes, it was exactly as awkward as it sounds, but we got through it. So uh, the backstory on this is, you know, after the amazing footage of Architeuthis the giant squid in 2012, NHK Enterprises, a Japanese natural history filmmaking company, produced some more episodes in their Project Deep Ocean series. And as part of this, they wanted to go to Antarctica and look for colossal squids. And so they reached out to me as a person who has done a few things with colossal squids from time to time. And it turned out that I was going to be in Japan at a cephalopod conference during the early planning stages for this episode. And so the producers came up and met with me at this conference. Um, I was six weeks pregnant at the time and I was sick as a dog and I was not telling anybody, but, you know, I, I had to, I had this conversation with the producers. I was excited about it and quite positive about it, but thinking the timing of this is terrible. They were planning to go right around my due date. And I'll just say my first child was born in 2012 as NHK was filming the giant squid. And I was just like, the universe hates me. <laughs> So I just thought, well, you know, things sometimes get delayed. So we'll just be positive about this. And in fact, it turned out that the trip did go a bit later and in fact went late enough that it was possible for me to participate. So, you know, I, I couldn't hide forever the fact that I was expecting offspring <laughs> imminently. And so they were fairly nervous, actually, I think, about inviting me because they just kind of couldn't believe that I was going to be willing to go when I had a small baby at home. And in fact, the final interview I had with them confirming that I was going to be participating was on Zoom. I was standing in my kitchen and I was wearing my two or three month old baby and rocking him while he was asleep on my chest. And I was assuring them that I was not going to flake out on them and that I was going to go. So they, you know, they were still a bit nervous, but they agreed to, to take me on board. And then we had to figure out some logistics, fairly heavy duty of how that was going to work. So he was seven months at the time that we went to see that was the start of 2017. So I was going to be away for five weeks and we were, you know, figuring out how that was going to work exactly, given that I was, you know, still nursing him um, and didn't want to just cut him off because I was going away and also just didn't want to deal with the weaning hormones because they're awful. <laughs> Yeah, it's a whole it's a whole other thing to deal with. And like, oh, my gosh, you know, the, the first time you go to the shop without them is is a wrench. So so five weeks is is a looming figure. And, and I was really lucky because I had actually I had sort of test driven this by going to see with Ambari when my older child was about 11 months old. So I was away for about 12 days at that time. And I had, you know, so I had tested out using really close <laughs> shared quarters as a milking shed with an unsuspecting roommate. And that had gone OK. And so, you know, I felt confident in my ability to make this work. So the aim was to be able to keep nursing him when I got back. So I went and I expressed um, for five weeks while we were on the ship in Antarctica. And we left from Ushuaia, which is in the southern tip of South America. We were going off to the Western Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, I actually looked into whether I could donate the milk locally when we got back on shore because I didn't really want to schlep it back with me. I just thought, well, I'm going to be producing it, but you know, I don't want to dump it down the sink or into the ocean either. And so I, I looked up how to try to say this in Spanish. So I went to the local hospital and I explained to them that I, in Spanish, bad, very bad Spanish. <laughs> it's not in the common phrase books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did a lot of Google Translate and then like practicing how to say this. And I had like a script that I took with me and stuff. And they were really surprised, I think, at what I was attempting to convey there. But OK, so no surprises. You can't just walk up and donate milk. So whatever. I figured I would just deal with that when we got back to shore. So across the voyage, I I did five submersible dives in the bubble subs that are that operate off Alusia, which is the ship we were on. So I spent about 35 hours in the subs and about 40 hours in total expressing milk on this trip. <laughs> and sometimes they overlapped. <laughs> they did. So about two times per dive because the dives were eight or nine hours. I would you know, whip out my scarf and the cameras were rolling the entire time. I was sitting uh, at very close quarters with a sub pilot and a cameraman. They didn't really know what to do about it. You know, there was the mics were running and I had these sort of noises going on. I was just like, well, it is what it is. And I think my depth record was 1,004 meters. 
there are challenges, of course, of when you do a long sub dive, you got to make the call beforehand of how you're going to handle your liquid input output, right? So, mm-hmm. which is what a lot of people ask us, but this is advanced level. This is far beyond that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so we got back to shore after five weeks, and I had more than 17 liters stored up in pouches in the freezer. And there was no way that I could donate it. I looked into a few other networks to see if I could do anything with it. But at that point, then I was like, okay, well, this is a lot and I don't want to dump it all down the sink. So I took 14 liters of it home with me in a cooler and I labeled it on the outside, clearly in English and Spanish. And I watched at least one baggage handler read the label and then rear back as though he had stepped in a wasp nest. <laughs> and while we were on the ship, my husband sent me a video of our son saying his first word. Oh, no. And it was data. Dada. You know, I, and fair enough, right? Like, I feel like that's that was well earned. But at the same time, it was definitely it was a moment for sure. We're having a little bit of fun with this and like presenting this as a funny story. But there's aspects, there's undertones to this. You know, this is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Yeah. We haven't even touched upon how hard that must have been to be away for that long. And that bittersweet first word is data and you know having to blaze a trail in these environments like it sounds like everyone was was kind of polite but you had lots of (laughs) confined spaces with really uncomfortable men yeah nobody ever said anything you know some of the sub pilots had small children as well so it was you know it was not entirely unfamiliar to everyone but certainly i got the impression that it was definitely the first time any of them had ever been in this situation (laughs) (laughs) i think that's a fairly safe bet which was true for me as well I'd, you know, been on a ship before in the same situation, but not certainly not a sub. Well, it was my first sub dive, so I was super excited. And you know, you don't you don't turn down an opportunity to go and participate and do some sub dives. So I was I was pretty excited about that and I love being at sea. And so, you know, I knew five weeks was a long time to be away and probably only under extreme circumstances would I go that long again, at least while my kids are reasonably little, but I loved it. It was a great trip. We saw some really amazing stuff. We happened to come across, I think, the highest latitude natural whale fall that's been reported to date. And so that wow. embarrassingly, that manuscript is now under review because stuff takes longer than you think it's going to. I, of course, got most excited about a little tiny incidental squid that appeared in the frame. So of course, in the documentary footage, there's this amazing whale fall scene and I'm losing my mind about a small squid that doesn't really have anything to do with it. <laughs> that's cool being a specialist. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we saw six Stygio medusa, you know, the giant jelly. We saw uh, the biggest blood belly comb jelly I've ever seen. I didn't realize they got that large. It was probably 40 oh. Or cool. 50 centimeters long. Whoa. We saw an ice fish on a nest. We saw uh, sea pigs, Protopedia. It turns out they glow in the dark, which is not that surprising because lots of uh, holothurians do that. But I don't think it's reported in that species yet. So that was pretty cool. So it was really, it was worth going. I had a great time. I'm glad. We did not see the colossal squid which was actually was okay with me. I kind of love that it's still a mystery. And we did see a different really big squid that I was I was kind of more excited about because it's in the family that I studied for my PhD. So my doctoral work was global revision of the deep sea squid family Onychotuthidae, which is the hooked squids. And the second biggest squid in that family is an Antarctic one formerly called Condacovia. And we did actually get the first live footage, as far as I know, of Condacovia and its natural habitat at about a thousand meters. So I was especially excited to see this one, right? I'd seen it like, you know, laid out dead and purple on the lab tables. And, you know, much like the first footage of Architeuthis, it looked just nothing like I had expected alive. It was silver and ghostly and beautiful and just, yeah, it was an amazing animal. It was mostly filmed by the other sub. And so the footage that they put in the documentary is me, again, kind of losing my mind as I watch the footage that the other sub recorded of this animal. So the other the other thing that happened is in the documentary then I it was narrated in English by Sir David Attenborough and I will say that when he said my name on the narration I was tempted to just pack up and retire because I was like well my career's peaked I nope I'm done well you've got your ringtone yes I do I do David Attenborough whispering from your pocket yeah <laughs> yes it's a terrible sound quality but I haven't changed it yet. <laughs> Right. So, so I, and unfortunately I had to make a liar of Sir David accidentally because the squid changed names right after the documentary. And that was my fault. And I knew it was happening, but the paper wasn't published yet. They're so weird about new names. I've got one I'm desperate to talk about, but yeah. if you accidentally say it somewhere, apparently it's void. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So so I knew that was happening. I knew that it, almost as soon as the film came out, the name was going to be wrong, but it wasn't published yet. So I, I had to go with the old name. And that was the name that everybody knew the squid by anyway. So I didn't feel too bad about it. But a little bit, I almost wanted to be like, can we just record two versions of this and you could just update the soundtrack? Like an academic book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Volume two. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Sir David, that I made a liar of you. But we, we must uphold scientific rigor here. Even against That's right. legends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, what an amazing experience. I think being a parent and going to see and that, that weird double-edged sword to that, because part of it is as well, like, you'd like them to be proud of you. You, you like, like the idea that like, mm -hmm. oh, mommy or daddy is an explorer or, or essentially yeah. they call you an octonaut now. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, mommy or daddy is an octonaut. But the other side of that is, you know, that mommy or daddy is, is away for a long period of time. And mm -hmm. I think we're getting a lot better at sharing the load. Like I've, I've really tried to be an equal partner with, with my partner, but mm. there is a biological load that you just, you just can't share. You, it just, it doesn't fall equally. That's right. And there's just no way around it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think a lot of us in the early days of parenthood, you know, you do just have to take a big break from field work if active field work is part of the work that you do. And so, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to come on and, and share this story was this kind of a an unorthodox way of <laughs> powering through those early days. Uh, the talk that I gave at my university when I came back was called What I Actually Did With My Parental Leave. <laughs> and you know, I thought I thought before I went really hard about a couple of things, including, you know, how safe is it to be doing this? How irresponsible am I being to actually go and, and, you know, sit in deep sea subs when I have a young family? And I did my research on that and I felt fairly confident about that. But I also thought about the fact that my older child would remember that I'd been away for that long, but the baby wouldn't remember. I would remember, but I knew that he mm. wouldn't remember. So and I want to send a big shout out, of course, to my husband, Gary, as well, who did not bat an eyelid when I suggested I might get invited to go to Antarctica for five weeks. He was like, of course you should go. So obviously without his support and co-parenting, none of this would have been possible either. The other thing that I did while I was away then was I actually took a little stuffed animal with me for each of them. And I, I'm sure actually that quite a few of us do this. But then I took photos of the little stuffed animals doing all sorts of stuff on the ship. Yeah. And they wrote messages home. And I ended up with sort of a little PowerPoint that I want to turn into a book file under stuff that's not done yet. But about their journey to Antarctica and how they reported back to my kids about what we were doing. Oh, I love that. Heather Stewart, the geologist who's been on a couple of times, she has Adventure Monkey, mm. who does exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just beautiful. These little these little coping strategies to sort of soften the blow. Yeah. When I was away, my wife played my lectures to our son. <laughs> so he still had my voice around. So she was just pottering around the room and there is me waffling on in Latin. That's amazing. But just so my voice was present in the house. Oh, that's really cool. That's a great idea. Yeah. We were, um, you know, the, the ship we were on was high tech enough that we were actually able to zoom from sea, which is kind of remarkable. So I was actually able to video chat with them a little bit while we were away and sort of like turn the screen and show them icebergs with penguins out the window. Uh, yeah, but it certainly was not as much contact as I would have liked, but, you know, far more than I could have expected. So yeah, I would never want to go back and not go, but there, you know, there definitely, there were tough things about it. Yeah. That's, that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do anyway. Like working at sea is tough. Mm. And, you know, when you've kind of left your heart on land, it feels a, it feels a long time and feels very far away. <laughs> well, I'll say two of my hearts were on land and my third heart was, you know, in the deep Antarctic with Condacobia slash Morotuthopsis. Incidentally, is a horrible name. I tried so hard to not change it from Condacobia to Morotuthopsis. There's, you know, a lot of squids and octopuses have names that end in toothis. And then we have the thing where like you sort of run out of creativity. You know, it has to have a different name. So instead of just toothis, it becomes toothopsis. Mm. And it just is not nice. <laughs> Some guy, Georg Preffer, like a hundred years ago was like, oh, I think this one might be a bit different. And if it turns out to be different, here's the name that I suggest. And that is the name that we are now saddled with. So thank you, Pfeffer. Taxonomy is a pretty strict place to operate. I know where they have to uphold the rules, but sometimes a silly name gets punted onto a wonderful animal. And sometimes 
sometimes when it had a nice name before. Like it's one thing if if you're the one who's choosing to give it a silly name because it didn't have a name before. And it's another thing when it had a nice name and then genetic evidence comes through that shows you that you have to revise things. And incidentally, our resident family wrecking geneticist is also Heather. I know that you've had a, a Heather <laughs> geneticist on the show. Something about them. <laughs> they just love to wreck taxonomic trees. <laughs> yeah, don't let them near the groups you love because they get wrecked. <laughs> There's a weird sort of confrontation sometimes between the, the classic morphological taxonomists and emergent mm. genetic techniques. And I, I can remember going into a museum to work on some specimen and almost at the door, I was asked how I felt about genetics. You know, it was like, are you one of us or one of them? Ooh, as like a screening question, are we going to let you in here? Yeah, very much so. But I, I think we're getting past that. And it is a, it is another tool. It is just like an x-ray. It is just like a CT scan. It is another tool that allows us to apply that. To be honest, considering mm. we've been doing it just based on common traits and yeah. really, really intricate people getting to know like a single genus for their whole life. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing how close we've done. You know, there, there is there is genetic upheavals, but it is amazing that purely through meticulous observation of morphology, that they're as right as they are. Uh, and yeah. so I think it's incredible what's been achieved. Yeah. And that technique remains incredibly powerful in a lot of groups, but there are definitely also groups where, you know, we know we've gotten as far as we can with the morphology and this extra tool is what actually lets us finally figure out what's going on. You know, a great example is the one of the most commonly fished flying squids in the North Pacific is called Omostrephes barchemise, the, the northern flying squid. And it was believed until quite recently that that's a circumglobal species and it's everywhere and it's mostly fished in the North Pacific, but, you know, other areas fish it as well. And then recent genetic evidence has shown that actually there are four different species worldwide. There's a North Pacific, a South Pacific, a North Atlantic, and a South Atlantic. And then, you know, that immediately has implications for how that fishery is managed because you can no longer say, well, you know, if we fish too many over here, they'll just come back from over there because it turns out that they're not interconnected <laughs> in the way that we thought they were. So yeah, especially when this kind of information comes in for things that we are harvesting on a commercial scale. I think one of the most powerful tools we have for making strong cases for managing things in a better way. Absolutely. It's, it's all more tools. It's all more power for us to make informed decisions. Yeah. As much as I, I'm excited and also very worried every time we get, you know, a plate of sequences back about what that's going to mean for the things I thought needed to be called certain things. And turns out that, you know, we have to revise things a bit. Yeah. I think overall the results is incredibly positive and is moving us forward. I agree. I started out as an isopod taxonomist. I worked at the Smithsonian for a little bit at the end of my high school career. I got to do an internship there and I got to describe two new species of isopod. And that was my like cool. entry to invert zoology. But, uh, you know, once once there was a pathway to the deep sea cephalopods for me, that was it. I was sold. And sometimes that's just the way it works. Like I keep telling students sort of during their first year, they'll come in and they want to do sharks and they want to do sea turtles. and They mm. want to do dolphins. And I, I say like by the end of this this three-year course, you probably don't even know what your favorite animal is yet because you don't know about it. Something is going to grab you. Something is going to absolutely fascinate you. And it might be a bacteria. It might be a tiny little flatworm, but something is going to absolutely spark your imagination. And you're going to be like, I want to know more about that. Yep. And you probably don't know what it is yet. <laughs> you don't know it exists. Yeah. I mean, I can pinpoint the exact moment when I knew that the deep sea was where I was headed. I took a marine biology course in high school and, you know, did a, a presentation project on anglerfish. And I think, you know, that's probably the gateway group for a lot of people who get into the deep sea is like, <laughs> Once you learn about anglerfish, you're like, oh, this is what I've got to do. There's stuff down there I have to know more about. But I had a, a few twists and turns and then the opportunity came up to do cephalopods and I was pretty happy about that. Amazing. We've touched upon lots of really exciting things that I think people would like to hear more about. So anything like the the Squid documentary, uh, your Twitter with Squid Cube, I'll, I'll put links to, to all of those if, you, if you're okay sharing those. Yeah, and, sure. uh, yeah send people that way because I think we've only just touched the surface of this. There's like, <laughs> there's some good stories here. Yeah, we, we have a pretty good time most of the time. Oh, thank you so much, Kat. That was, I really enjoyed that. Oh, thank you for having me. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company, Amatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can provide the technology and know-how to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience through storytelling, fact-checking, 
or presentations, we can help with that as well. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone.